footprints falling lead us to Thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where The whole time for that to load. How about that? All right. All right. Just in the nick of time. Okay, someone gets the privilege now of, of requesting the final hymn request of 2018. 425. Mr. Jack rose to the occasion there. 425. He keeps me singing. That's very symbolic. That's great. What a way to end it. Well done, sir. There's within my soul a melody Jesus whispers sweet and low Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still In all love's life's ebb and flow Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Well, th thank you very much for your requests each week. I really enjoy getting uh, introduced to new songs from time to time and also getting to see what songs are particularly special to you, uh, my church family. So, Will, did you find in 1 Corinthians? Well, Timmy is right. This is our last evening worship service, uh, regular evening worship service for the year. I know you're thinking, well, it's September, but uh, we've got six weeks of discipleship classes that begin next Sunday. So uh, if you have your bulletin, you'll see a list of those classes. Let me just go over those real quick uh, and encourage you to join one of them. Uh, Don Walker is going to be teaching a class. Uh, it's entitled here as Logos, a free Bible software for your iPad and iPhone. It's also available for Android as well. I think a more catchy name is like Discipleship in the 21st Century because many of you have, uh, you know, have your iPhones, you've got your iPads, and if you've ever found yourself sitting in a doctor's office, instead of playing uh, you know, one of those games that you always play on your phone, if you have these apps, you can just pull them up and you can do Bible study right there. So if you're uh, studying for a Sunday school lesson, there's ways that you can uh, do that right there while you're waiting for the doctor. And so uh, I think that's going to be a great class. Again, the software that he's going to be using is completely free. A lot of the resources uh, are completely free. There are books that you can buy with the software, but he's going to show you how you can utilize it completely free. So that's going to be uh, a really great class that Don's going to be teaching, and that will be in the adult education building. Mike Brooks is going to be teaching Biblical Foundations for Missions. This is uh, a curriculum that's put out by our International Mission Board where they essentially explain why we do missions, what, what is the biblical mandate for missions, why do we take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Uh, and then Timmy's going to be singing, or singing, he's going to be teaching a book called Sing, How Worship Transforms Your Life, Family, and Church. Now, let me say that uh, you do not have to be able to sing to take his class. I, I did check and make sure of that. So even if you can't sing, you're still welcome to take his class. Uh, essentially, if you uh, have heard of Keith and Kristen Getty, uh, they are the authors of this book. They, uh, yeah, In Christ Alone is their, their big uh, song that most people are familiar with. Uh, they kind of got a, a little bit of a Celtic feel to them, um, but they, they do a great job of, of reminding people why we sing in church and why singing is so important. Uh, when Keith Getty was here, uh, when was that, Timmy? You know, okay, back in December, he, he talked about the importance of kids hearing their parents sing. And if you know me, I, I, I can't sing. I'm not any good. But I thought, I want my kids to hear me sing in church. I want them to know that this is a part of, of worship, and I want them to see me doing it. Uh, and so now in, in Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings, I sing, and I sing loud, and uh, my kids look at me sometimes and tell me to stop. But uh, I figure, hey, at least they know I'm singing, they know I'm worshiping. So uh, there's some great spiritual truth in, in that book study. Uh, so I encourage you, if, if that seems of interest to you, to take that class. 
And then I'll be teaching a six-week study on the Old Testament. So if you've ever found the Old Testament uh, a, a book that you, or, or a section of Scripture that you're just afraid of, that you don't understand, I promise you in six weeks you'll be able to know the, his, the entire historical narrative of the Old Testament. Uh, I'm going to even go as far to say you'll probably be able to name all ten commandments in order. You'll know all the 12 tribes of Israel. Maybe, you know, you may struggle with a name or two. But we're going to talk about the, the narrative flow of the Old Testament. It's going to be a quick uh, uh, study of the Old Testament, six weeks long, uh, studying 39 books. But it'll be a great time for those of you that maybe it's been a while since you've studied the Old Testament. It'll be a great refresher for you. So those are your options. And again, those classes start at 530 next Sunday night. So we'll go the night of the 7th, the night of the 14th. The October 21st is our church picnic, so that morning we'll have worship here, and then you will either get in our cars or you can get on the church bus, and we'll head out to Earl Trent Assembly Camp and spend an afternoon outdoors, uh, and there'll be no evening services that night, and then we'll come back and do our uh, next few classes the following weeks. And then that brings us to Thanksgiving, and we're having family, uh, you know, our holiday meal. Then it's Christmas time, and we've got musicals, so all that that's going on, uh, it's, it's, the end of the year is already upon us. It just seems like it's flown by. Well, as, Tim and Lee, Tim, as Timmy uh, joked earlier, we've been going through a sermon series on 1 Corinthians now for two years, and I had one Sunday where we're finished with 1 Corinthians, but we're not going to have another Sunday night service again until January. And so I thought, what do I preach on for just a, kind of a one sta- sermon or a standalone message? And I was drawn to the book of Hebrews. So I want to invite you, if you have your Bible, to turn to Hebrews chapter, 11, or chapter 10. Um, we'll be looking at verses 19 through 25. As you're turning there, let me kind of give you a little bit of a reminder about the book of Hebrews. We have no idea who wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, Some have attributed it to Paul. It's very unlikely that Paul wrote the book. And the reason I say that is because if you find Paul's letters, one of the things that he does every time is he says, hey, this is Paul, and I'm writing to you the church at Philippi or the church at Corinth or this church or that church. And there's no introduction. Paul doesn't introduce himself and say, hey, this is Paul. So there's a lot of speculation as to who the author is, who's writing uh, the book of Hebrews. The truth is, is it really doesn't matter. We absolutely believe that the uh, Holy Spirit inspired the author to write these, these words. And the book of Hebrews was written to the Jews, to the Hebrews, with the purpose of helping them to understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament. And so there's a lot of nuances, a lot of, a lot of references to the Old Testament uh, story, a lot of references to the Old Testament background. Immediately in chapter 10, the author is dealing with the sacrificial system. So for those of you that know your Old Testament, you go to Le- Leviticus chapter 16, and you read about the Day of Atonement. Anybody heard of the Day of Atonement? Most of you, I think, have. On the Day of Atonement, it was a one day of the year, where the high priest would go into the most holy place of the temple. So in the temple, you had uh, kind of a, the, the, uh, the general area, then you had the court of the women, then you had the court of the Gentiles, then you had the court of the men, and then you had the holy area where only priests could go, and then you had the holy of holies. Well, one day a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into the holy of holies. And this place was so holy, in fact, that he was only allowed, to, again, to go in one time a year. They had a big curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from, all, from, from the holy place where they would do sacrifices. And the high priest would prepare himself before he would go in and offer this sacrifice to the Lord on the Day of Atonement. So sacred was this activity that they began to come up with stipulations. What were they going to do if, say, the high priest went into this holy place, went into the Holy of Holies, what if the Lord did not accept their sacrifice and he just dropped dead? How would they retrieve the body of the high priest? How would they know if, if the Lord had accepted their sacrifice? How would they know if the, the, the high priest was still in there moving? And so they came up with several different things that they would do. First, they would put bells on the bottom of the high priest's garment. So they would know, they would kind of hear the, the bells jingling, and they would know, okay, the high priest is still doing the work that he's supposed to be doing. They would know that he hadn't fallen down dead. They would listen for the bells to make sure that the Lord had accepted the sacrifice. And they even would tie a rope onto the leg of the high priest so that if for some reason they, the, the Lord 
killed the high priest because he didn't accept the sacrifice. They could pull the rope and get the high priest out of there and then properly bury his body. They, they knew that if the high priest died and they went in, they, the, the, the thought was that God would just strike anybody dead that would enter. I mean, this was a, a holy place. And every year on the Day of Atonement, they would come in and the high priest would, would bathe and he'd wash and, 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 and do everything that was, that was required, put on special clothing to go in and offer a sacrifice on the, uh, what was called the mercy seat, on the Ark of the Covenant. It was considered God's throne. So the high priest would go in and do this every year. Year after year, confessing the sins of Israel. Well, the writer of Hebrews tells us that, I mean, if you just look at verse 4 of chapter 10, he says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. He says all of these sacrifices they weren't sufficient. They were, they were insufficient to truly take away the sins of mankind. And so the writer of Hebrews is, is giving us a, a, a case in point to say that Jesus Christ comes in and he fulfills all that the Old Testament required. So he becomes the high priest and he becomes the sacrifice. And so the writer of Hebrews is talking about how Jesus is the fulfillment of of the day of atonement jesus offered his own body he's he's his own high priest he's god in the flesh and he didn't just go into a room made by man he went into the very throne room of god in heaven to offer himself as a sacrifice and so the writer of hebrews is is saying that when jesus does this there's no longer a need for any more offerings of sin we get into verse 19 so in light of all that jesus has done in light of the fact that Jesus is the, the new high priest, in light of the fact that Jesus has offered the complete sacrifice, in light of the fact that there's no need for the Day of Atonement anymore, he says this in verse 19, the writer of Hebrews. He says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The writer of Hebrews says, because of all that Christ has done, therefore, we ought to rejoice. Therefore, he says, we ought, we ought to, to have this confidence to go into the holy places by the blood of Jesus. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, because of what Jesus did, we as believers, as his followers, have been covered in his blood, and we have complete and total access to God. Whereas in the Old Testament, again, Leviticus 16 talks about how the high priest could only go in there one day a year, and the high priest could only go in there as long as he had the right garments and as long as he'd done, brought the right sacrifices. I mean, so fearful again were they that the high priest, that God would not accept the offering, that the high priest would die. They put bells on him and they put uh, a rope around his ankles. So fearful they were in approaching God. And the writer of Hebrews says, hey guys, now that Jesus Christ has done this for us, now that he has paid the price for our sin, that he has given his life, now we have confidence that we can boldly enter that holy place. We can boldly go to the throne room of God by the blood of Jesus. He says, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. He says, no longer is that curtain that separated the most holy place from the holy place. No longer is that curtain a barrier for God's people. Now we can go straight into the throne room. We don't have to worry about a curtain blocking us. We don't have to worry about anything. We don't have to worry about the Lord not accepting our sacrifice because Jesus Christ offered that sacrifice for us. We go straight through the curtain, he says, by a new and living way. The word new here in the Greek, it means... Something that wasn't possible before. We, we think of new in, in several different ways. You know, if I can buy a new car, it means no one's touched it. This, this word implies something that's, that's not been possible before. And so he says this is a new and a living way. How were they able to access the, the throne room of God before? Not through a living sacrifice, but for, through a sacrifice of animals where they would literally slaughter 
tens of thousands of animals year-round in the temple. And now, no longer are they offering dead animals to the Lord. They offered, Jesus Christ offered his life to the Lord, and Jesus Christ rose from the dead, so he's a living sacrifice. He says, by a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And so here the writer of Hebrews says, this is what Jesus has done for us. He has offered himself on our behalf. So much so that we don't have to go and slaughter the blood of animals. We don't have to go and and worry about the high priest having a sacrifice that is acceptable to the Lord. God has accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his only son. And then he he moves into verse 22. He says, now let us, and then verse 23, let us, and then verse 24, let us. Three times we have this command. He says, now let us do this. Essentially, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is he's saying because of what Jesus has done, because of the access that we have to God through Jesus Christ, because of the sacrifice that Christ made, first... Verse 22, let us draw near. He says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled and clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near. The writer of Hebrews is saying to those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, for those of us who have accepted the sacrifice of Christ for our sins, he's saying, hey, you know what? You now have access to God, so don't stay away from God. Let us, let's all draw near to God. There is nothing in our way. There's nothing keeping us from God. So let us draw near to God, and let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of our faith. He's talking about the confidence that we have to go to God. Our hearts have been covered with the sacrifice of Christ. We're cleansed from evil. And he says, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Now, some people have taken this passage and they've said, well, they're talking about baptism here, the washing that takes place in baptism. I don't think that's what he's talking about at all. Remember, the context here is the Day of Atonement. You go back to Leviticus 16, I believe it's verse 5, that talks about how he's he's washing himself, preparing himself. And so he's using the language of, of ritual cleansing. And he's saying, we've been washed... By the blood of Jesus Christ, our bodies have been clean. And so we can draw near to God with full assurance. We can draw near to God with our hearts sprinkled. We can draw near to God with our bodies washed. There is nothing in the way between us and God. There's no curtain that's keeping us. We don't have to put bells on. We don't have to tie rope around our ankles. We can go directly to God and have access to God. He says, because of what Jesus has done, let us draw near. And then he moves on in verse 23. He says, let us also hold fast. Let us draw near is the idea of us coming to Christ and receiving salvation. It's the picture of us, of Christ paying the price for our sin. Let us draw near is the picture of you and I coming to Christ and accepting Christ as our Savior. Then he says, let us hold fast. This is the idea of us persevering in our faith. It's the idea of us holding fast, not letting go, holding on to the confession of our hope without wavering. Why can we do that? How can we do that? Well, because our God is faithful. Isn't that what we sang tonight? Great is thy faithfulness. He says we we can come to God and we hold fast, we persevere, we stand firm Because we've got a faithful God that will see us through anything that might try to knock us down, that might try to tear us down. Because of what Christ has done, we can draw near. There's nothing keeping us from getting to God. Because of what Christ has done, we can hold fast, we can persevere in the faith. Here the writer of Hebrews is saying what I believe Jesus was teaching when we talked about a couple weeks ago about abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ means to, to not just make a one-time decision and say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang with you for a little while unless something better comes along. Abiding in Christ means, Lord, I'm with you, and I'm dwelling with you, and I'm staying with you. Holding fast means, Lord, I've made a decision to draw near to you, and I'm not letting you out of my sight. 
I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to hold fast to you. And I'm going to trust that no matter what happens, no matter how hard the world tries to pull me away, I'm going to continue to cling to you because you are faithful. And you won't let go of me. We hold fast. Because of what Christ has done, we can draw near to God. We can receive him as our Lord and Savior. We can be washed in his blood. We can be sprinkled with his blood. We can hold fast following him with a a faith that perseveres no matter what. And then in verse 24, he gives us another command. He says, let us draw near. Let us hold fast. And then finally, he says, let us stir up. Verse 24, he says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. He says, let us stir up. Let's just be honest. Every single one of us are good at stirring up something. I mean, if, if you're a member of a church, you're good at stirring up something. I mean, I've seen too many churches where they get stirred up. But what are we stirring up to? Stirring up trouble? No, that's not what he's talking about. We're stirring up love, good works. What he's saying here, and and this is the progression of our faith. We draw near to God. We say to God, Lord, I need your forgiveness. I need you to wash me and make me clean. I need to be forgiven of my sins. And because of the sacrifice that you made, I can draw near to you. You've torn down the curtain. You've taken away every barrier. I can come to you. And then as I've made that profession, then I make the commitment, Lord, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to hold fast. I'm going to persevere. And then the next step in our Christian faith is to stir up one another. We have this, I think, false understanding that Christianity is a solitary thing, that we can just say, you know what, I'm, I'm good on my own. And I don't need anybody else. It's just me and Jesus. And that sounds really spiritual, doesn't it? I mean, that that sounds the gathering together. We can't neglect to meet together. As 